Uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you uh, to uh, this part of Wales. Uh, I'm sure you will find Ivers and Avaris was generally very friendly. And uh, particularly, uh, Alison, thank you for coming uh, to speak to us uh, this evening. Uh, Alison, Professor at uh, James Hutton Institute in Aberdeen, uh, an extensive uh, legacy and history of research and contribution to uh, land use and land use change. Uh, some very relevant examples from uh, Scotland. Uh, a very timely contribution this evening, I feel, uh, given that the amount of uh, interest there is in what we want our land to do, uh, what we want particularly our marginal land to do, uh, which uh, makes it very difficult to see a way forward without significant support from the public for any sort of commercial or farming operation to occur. That question about actually what do we want the land to do, how do we get the land to do it, is extremely pertinent. Uh, Ivers, as uh, those of you from Ivers, uh, has a health chain that we all try to contribute along. At one end, there's a really important bit that at the end of the day, we want to have healthy humans that feel good about it, uh, about being a, which is healthy, healthy humans with improved well-being. At the other end, and there's lots of little bits along the other side, is a healthy environment. But the healthy environment starts it all and also encompasses everything along that chain. And I think land use is a particularly person part of that environment uh, that affects us all, certainly affects human health and human well-being. Uh, we've gone through various phases of thinking various buzzwords are really important. Sustainability seems to have come and gone to be replaced by resilience. Um, resilience is now sort of uh, derogue, and but maybe what we're really talking about is adaptability, uh, able to adapt, able to work out where we're going, where we want to go. And if you look around the countryside around here, there are some things that have worked in terms of land use change, in terms of providing a productive and useful environment. But there are also vast areas where we, what we've ended up with, and I suspect uh, many of us have travelled through some of the uplands behind here and despaired at the... Uh, the heterogeneous of senescent millennia, thinking, how did we get here? Whatever it is, we didn't really want to end here. Uh, so understanding land use change, its importance to uh, the economy, but also to human health and well-being is particularly interesting. And in any way, trying to predict what sorts of interventions might end up in one sort or other of outcome is highly important to us. So without further ado, many thanks. I, I'm reliably informed from her biography on the, on the web that uh, Alison is uh, heavily involved in management boards and steering committees across Europe. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, she's gone from Scotland to, uh, to Wales. But no, but in terms of the Euro um, uh, advisory boards and the natural environment advice, uh, Alison makes a significant contribution. It also says that she works across the disciplines and absolutely in land use. One of the great weaknesses of Ivers, I would say, is uh, the lack of economic and social science uh, to mix with our natural uh, scientists. Uh, but it's something that Alison, in an arena that Alison is, is comfortable in, working across multidisciplinaries and uh, to make progress. And also the engagement of the public, and I think this is part of that role. Alison, thank you very much for coming. It's been a joy, I know, for a number of staff uh, to talk to you today uh, as you visited us, but we look very much forward to your talk to us this evening. Thank you very Excellent. much. Thank you. Thank you. And first and foremost, thank you very much for the invitation to come here. It's not often that I make this journey, so it's been a real pleasure to be here. And thanks to all of you who spent time with me today, either up on the hill or in the meeting rooms. It was really nice to meet everybody. So. It's my pleasure to address some um, issues from Scotland and something that's particularly interesting to me is to uh, hear about similarities and differences with what you have here as well. So I'd, I'd love to hear a bit more about that in our discussion time. So what I'm going to um, do to today is um, focus on this issue of addressing land use trade-offs. Um, but I'm going to talk to you about some of the, what I've called here, research into action that we do at the James Hutton Institute. A lot of that's going directly to the Scottish Government to try to help them improve their policy making and policy implementation. So that's the big focus today. So this is kind of roughly how I'm going to structure my talk. I'll introduce you with a few key issues about tackling trade-offs. I'll 
touch upon Scotland's overall vision for land use and some of the strategy documents, deal with a bit of policy integration delivery, show you some research that my colleagues have been doing on that, and then um, quite a chunk of slides on tools to inform and support decision making, partly because I think they're really interesting. Um, and then I'll touch upon participatory methods, which of course is increasingly important when we try to involve um, all of us human beings in making decisions. And then I'll finish with a little bit of a um, summary on recognising the limits to all of this. So let's have a look at some of the key issues. So I, I want to really state right up front that we are, with most things in life, dealing with a legacy, with a history of where we've come from. And most policies that we have in the UK, strategies and policies, were developed when focus was very single sector. Trade-offs weren't really explicitly acknowledged. So, so we are coming from that. And it's very easy to look at something and be critical without remembering that actually this is the way things were done before. So there's always a bit of catching up to do. So I think it's important to put that right up the top here. But of course, we know that land management decision making is absolutely full of trade-offs. Everything we do across different sectoral interests affects something else. And there's just a few of the different sectors. If you make a decision in one of those, it's likely to have knock-on effects, either intended or unintended, on many of, of those other sectors listed there and beyond. And the third point I want to make, that if we are trying to manage these trade-offs, we do need to take an integrated approach. And this is very easy to say and not so easy to do. And this has to be the case across all levels of governance. To do, and, and I've said this, this is the holy grail, isn't it? To maximise environmental and social well-being. So if we're aiming for that holy grail, how on earth do we integrate across all these traditionally very different sectors? So here is a top-level vision. Um, for integrating nature and society, which is very encouraging. So this is from the Scottish Government's economic strategy, which is quite notable. So you can see I've put in bold um, at the top there that natural resources sit right within the middle of the statement about what Scotland's economic prosperity depends upon. Um, and the second statement below, again, you can see the, uh, the overarching economic and regulatory environment also determines not just social but also environmental outcomes. So there are very strong statements at the top level in these documents that indicate a very clear understanding that we need to integrate across people and environment. So that's great. And the strategic approach, like you would have here, um, we have this whole nested series. We have global strategies. We have European strategies that we still have to address. Uh, and we have this translated down into national and actually local level approaches. So nearly every strategy that you follow through will go right the way down that chain. And we have everything from regulation through to voluntary initiatives to achieve different targets, not just relating to land use. This is a model that fits across many systems. So I'm going to give a series of ticks here. So there is now, across most of Scotland's strategies, a clear recognition of the critical importance of the natural environment for both economic and societal needs, like the quote that I showed you, so that gets a tick. What's also great is that many of the strategies now directly address multiple benefits, again, both for environment and people, and they are also broadly supported by stakeholders, both in the environmental and the rural land use sector, so that gets two ticks. And there is a strong push, um, not just from the government, but from many land managers, for us as researchers, to um, give them modelling and mapping tools that can help support them in making decisions in what is a very, very complicated, once you start trying to integrate across land use, it's very complicated. So they're crying out for help, and this is where us scientists come in here. So Scotland's land use strategy is the main one I'm going to focus on today. A lot of the research I'm going to talk is directly commissioned by the Scottish Government to help operationalise this strategy. Come in. And what it is, is it's described as a long-term vision, again, for economy, environment and community, so it's integrating. And the quote here is to recognise, understand and value the importance of our land resources. It's what's called a steering strategy, which is also a little bit of a departure from how strategies used to be. And the idea is promoting integrated and innovative land use decision making for multiple benefits. Sounds great. It's very strongly focused on this lovely new concept of the ecosystem approach and it's directly addressing trade-offs. So for those of you in the room um, who either don't like or don't um, follow some of these new terms that keep coming and going, which you mentioned earlier, here is the definition from the United Nations Convention on Biological Diversities. So it's basically about integrated management of natural resources, 
but important to note is that it, as well as promoting conservation and sustainable use, these words in an equitable way. So the idea is that everybody benefits equally. So what they did in Scotland was they set up two regional land use pilots to help test and operationalise this land use strategy. So they, they were carried on for a number of years. They have both reported, they took very different approaches, reported, sent the reports into the Scottish Government and we're waiting now for their response on what they want to do next. So there's a lot of learning in there and hopefully they'll come up with some nice decisions on, on where they go next in terms of operationalising this strategy. So the research that we do at the James Hutton Institute related to the land use strategy is basically aimed to support implementation of this strategy by, for example, developing and analysing different approaches which might be taken, explicitly examining trade-offs, um, developing and testing different tools, and also looking at the importance of different governance approaches to the success of implementing a strategy like this. So there's a whole range of different disciplines involved here, and I'll touch upon some of them as I go through. So of course, top level statement here, if you're trying to operationalise an integrated vision, you've got to have good integration across policies. So the piece of research I want to tell you here, in fact, I will take a point of noting that you will see this middle screen is a little bit washed out, but these two screens are okay, so <laughs> whenever you're struggling to see something on there, put your eyes to the left or the right. So the land use strategy, as I um, indicated, it has a strong strategic vision and it has a good steer. But the question that our researchers were looking at was basically, do we have appropriate policy instruments in place to help deliver these multiple benefits and address these trade-offs as required by the strategy? So what they found immediately when they looked at the um, uh, policy instruments was that it's a very crowded and very complicated network of instruments. And the trouble with that on the ground, if you're a land manager or a land user, is that there can be a perception that some of these policy instruments are, are contradicting each other. So they, they, there's a lot of comment that they, there are policy conflicts and what do we do. So that's one of the things that researchers specifically looked at. So what they did in this piece of work example that I'm going to give you today is they basically looked at policies specifically written for water, biodiversity and soil and they picked 10 policy instruments out of more than 50 addressing these three and they covered again incentives through regulations and advice. So I'm going to show you a delightful diagram now which you don't have to read all of. <laughs> this is my simplified version of what the researchers gave me. So basically, I'll take you through roughly what it shows, and then I'll just give you three highlight messages from it. So on the left-hand column there, you can see those are the three focus areas that I told you about. So you've got water, biodiversity, soil, and some which actually link across all three. The second column, you've got what are called the parent policies or the legislation. So if you just look at that blue box at the top, you can see all of those relate to water, so we've got the EU Water Framework Directive, which uh, still we address <laughs> and we follow. And each of the countries, you'll have done the same here, has their own um, brackets Scotland Act, brackets Scotland regulations. So um, it's translated down to the Scottish level in those second two boxes. Follow that across to the third column. You can see that there are two lines coming out. One is called the Water Environment Fund, and the, uh, below that is called Controlled Activities Regulations. If you then follow the Water Environment Fund to the final column, um, you'll see it's called an incentive. So that one is incentivizing people to do something. The next one down, the Controlled Activities Regulations, is a regulation, so i.e. you have to do something. So that's the kind of difference. So the whole table is basically tracing these 10 policy instruments and defining them in terms of what they do. So here's your take home messages. What they found first and foremost is that just out of water biodiversity and soil comparisons, the natural assets were managed very, very differently. So water has very strong and very explicit regulation, and that'll be the same here. Soil, on the other hand, is um, where it appears is really just guidance or indirect regulation. So that's a big difference. There were some apparent overlaps between policies. That's not conflicts, that's overlaps, and also gaps. And this was most prevalent within those relating to farming. And the third box here, that they didn't actually find any obvious conflicts between instruments. So despite the perception on the ground that there were conflicts, there's no evidence for there actually being conflicts between the policy instruments. That's good. Um, they also didn't find any integrated instruments. You can see I've written fine, question mark. It may be OK if none of your poli policy instruments actually integrate as long as they can work together. So what they then looked at is how was the cross-referencing between these instruments, and that's where they found much poorer cross-referencing than they would expect to see 
if these policies are really all working together. So that's an area that then they can go back to the Scottish Government and say, well, this is where we think you need to have a look more closely at how your policies are actually cross-referencing each other. So let's have a look then, if we are wanting to improve delivery of these policies, what are some of the key high-level issues? So as we know with anything in life, doing something differently is not always easy. It needs a lot of time and it needs a lot of skill. So for example, the land use policy introducing this thing called the ecosystem approach doesn't mean anything to most people in Scotland. So it's got what my um, social science colleagues call sticking points, and they've written a whole series of papers on it, which you can see at the bottom if you want to follow up. Um, and these sticking points have to be identified and addressed if we're going to introduce a new approach like this and actually have some success. So you see the little red arrow that's appeared on the right there. My colleagues found that most of these sticking points where the ecosystem approach kind of got stuck and didn't go any further were either institutional, for example, an administrative procedure that made it difficult to work across disciplines, or they were cognitive, i.e. people's ways of thinking hadn't caught up with this new approach, or they were political in that maybe a, a current regulation or a policy or a, a funding mechanism is actually making it very difficult to do integrated land use. So those are the three main areas um, where there are what's called sticking points. The second main uh, issue here that I want to highlight is that new approaches are not necessarily silver bullets. And there's a lot of focus now on this thing called payments for ecosystem services, which we can all talk, also talk about later if you want to. Um, but what's very, very important to realise is that before you jump into a new approach like this, you need to really be sure you understand the pros and cons before applying them. And payments for ecosystem services were first um, used in, in, any, in a major way in South America, interestingly enough. And sometimes there's been some absolutely disastrous consequences because they weren't aware of the wider impacts of something that they were then paying the land managers to be doing. So it's, it's great on paper, but it's very, very challenging to do. And part of this is just because there's, there's data shortages across the, the range. So the third point here is that, that it is very important also to be aware that the best times to make change are when uh, what's called here windows of opportunity align. So when the problem and the politics and the capacity align. And whatever we might think about Brexit, <laughs> we do have an opportunity here to rethink completely the way that our policy instruments are written and the way that they work. So I'm not saying anything more about that political statement, but there is an opportunity in there if we want to take it. So I'm now going to spend a little bit of time on tools. So, so this is really important because we have such a wealth of data out there relating to land use that it's much simpler if it can be all brought together by a specialist and translated into something simple and straightforward that a politician can easily use. They're busy people, they're not specialists, they need something straightforward. So here's the top level really of, of what I see to be the key requirements here if you're making a tool for land use. Of course, step number one, we need to map natural resources, not only what's there, where it is, but also what state it's in. We need to now um, look at the ecosystem services, again, another buzzword, what services are actually being produced by different natural resources, but also what the potential is that's not being realised. And of course, everything sits now in terms of this global change context, and we have to think about that when we're planning now. What about the future? Second important requirement is a stakeholder analysis. So just knowing about your natural resources alone is not going to get you anywhere. We need to understand how and where they're being used, who's using them, what are the impacts of that use, again, not just in space, but also in time. And the third big area here is about governance. So this is basically um, the this definition that I like is, is who has the authority, who's making the decisions, and who's accountable. And again, that operates across all sectors and all scales. It's really important because that's what's going to make a policy succeed or fail. So here's a, another beautiful slide to illustrate that actually we're in a very exciting era for data and data analysis. There is a, an absolute host of information out there, and there are fantastically powerful computing facilities now to bring this together and make sense out of it. So if I just run you through the, this, I'm um, not sure if I, oh yes, there is a pointer on here. If we start at top here, there is increasingly improving Earth observation information um, through from the traditional satellite imagery. And now you can, you can get almost daily updates on things, and um, you can go down to very, very detailed scales. So that is incredibly impressive nowadays and that doesn't just give you on the information on what resources you have but increasingly people are being able to actually look at what condition they're into just from earth observation data in scotland we have what's called the national soil inventory of scotland so it's a, a um, 
very long legacy of soil sampling, which gives you a really strong baseline. Um, I don't know if you have something similar in Wales. It would be interesting to ask that. There are also a whole series of um, data sets on land cover and land use. You, again, will have all of these same data sets for Wales. There's very good ability to do digital terrain modelling now. And there are all these things that I've just lumped under this natural heritage category. We've got a heap of data on habitats, species, protected areas, cultural artefacts, you name it. There's a huge amount of data. And then over on here, this is perhaps the newest and the most interesting in some ways, is what I've called here volunteer geographic information. So this is the kind of thing where people will upload their photographs to Google and you can use those photographs to tell you a whole load of extra information that you wouldn't otherwise be able to get. So enormous potential. So you imagine bringing all of this together now with the sufficient computing power to actually process that and make sense out of it and give fairly simple, straightforward answers out the other side. To me, this is a really exciting time to, to be living, if you like, to see that we can do all of this now. So what I want to do now is, is show you some of the tools which my colleagues have been working on and explain some of what they do and the potential and where they're going. So this is um, the, the first of, the, of a few tools that I'll show you. This was developed with funding from the National Trust in Cumbria, so they asked for this specifically. And they basically wanted to, to get an idea of how best to manage um, Cumbria and its natural resources. So what our colleagues did was, was basically create what, what are called opportunity maps. I've just given you four examples along the bottom here. So what these do is identify from all the best available data where a particular ecosystem service um, has good or bad potential. So this, for example, is carbon storage. So good will be the blue, and red will be the, the bad. Um, and uh, this is erosion regulation. This one is um, timber production. This one is cultural heritage. So there are hundreds of these opportunity maps across all different ecosystem services. So what the scientists do is bring these all together and um, produce first the opportunity maps, and you can do it just for these individual functions like I've shown you here, or you can do it for combined functions as well and have a look at the where you might get the best of three different services, for example. And then uh, the important point here is that you then bring this to a workshop, for example, and you ask the stakeholders to actually say what are their land use or ecosystem service priorities. So in this case, National Trust in Cumbria, what are your priorities and what are the people who are living there in the land, what are their priorities? So the output then is a whole range of land use change options, different scenarios, and advice about what they might do and where in order to achieve the aims that they're saying that they want. So here's an example with a, a screenshot of the, of the technicalities. And I'll just take you through basically what it's doing. So what the National Trust said is that they have specific targets for forest expansion that they need to address, but they also want to improve water cycling across the lakes. They've identified that as being a problem. So immediately what the computer scientists are doing here is they are saying, right, we've got water purification as an ecosystem service, we've got nutrient cycling, but we've also got erosion regulation. We will ramp those three up as being the most important ecosystem services. They get the priority when they run the model. Then there's these three requirements that are specified by the client. So this is the target, 10,000 hectares of woodland expansion. Um, importantly, they want no arable decrease within Cumbria at all. They want to keep it exactly as it is. And they want no land use change in protected areas. So no, none of this woodland expansion can happen in arable areas or in protected areas. So you just put all those constraints into your model. And it comes with it up with a map like this. And this is where this isn't a very good screen. You can see it better on these two. But basically, the different colours on this map indicate where it's better or worse to encourage your woodland expansion in order to achieve the specific aims that you as the client or the land user or the land manager have specified that you want prioritised. So it's great because it immediately gives you an idea of what you're trading off because you can then go back and look at the maps and see what's actually going to be um, less good in those areas where you're planting trees. What are you losing as a consequence of planting your woodland in these areas? And it's really powerful in terms of aiding decision making. When you get people together and they see this and see the bigger picture that none of us can see in our individual areas where we live, it's very, very powerful for helping to achieve consensus. So that was mark one. Mark two is now called Melodic, and it's on the web, so you can play with this yourselves. So this is back to Scotland, and this is directly addressing some of the government's requirements. It's again a series of opportunity maps, um, and it's it's exactly the same intention, it's a web-based mapping tool and its idea, its idea is to support 
decision making about land use for multiple benefits. But the difference here is because it's web based and it's interactive, you can either um, look at it on your own or you can look at it together, you know, as an individual or in terms of looking at a particular policy regulation. You can do what you want. So that's that's what people do, and then they can immediately get a, one of these maps, like I showed you for Cumbria, and visualise where the best recommendation would be to do something, but what the consequences would be for anything else. So re really, I think it's a brilliant tool. But, <laughs> as with all the buts, what they found, uh, the biggest limitation of this is actually data, and particularly when you go down to local scales. So national level data is actually pretty good for a lot of these different um, categories, but local data is a real problem. So here's an example of a screenshot just to show you what it looks like and you will see, uh, uh, probably better on these sideways screens, but these are all little bars that you, when you're actually at, uh, um, accessing the web page, you can move those bars right or left and make your own decisions about what you want to be the most important and this map will change when you move those bars right and left. So you can immediately see if you're going to prioritise water, for example, like in, <coughs> I showed you in Cumbria, how where you should plant your woodland will change and if you then prioritize something else you'll see it could move to a completely different place so this brings me neatly to uh, what i said at the beginning it's not just where you put stuff but it's what about the future are you thinking about what you're doing now and what might be the implications in future and i want to spend three slides on that so i'll stick with the woodland expansion partly because it's my favorite topic area as well but it's also because it's, there's a really nice example here of why it's important to look ahead so we have in scotland a target to expand Scotland's woodland area to 25% by 2050. We're woefully behind, um, but the intention is still there, and there's a lot of hard work going on to try to do that. So there are a whole range of aims for this. Yes, we um, are trying to meet the EU, translated into UK and then Scottish level biodiversity targets. We're also trying to meet greenhouse gas emission targets, and you can see I made a little bit of a gap there between S and Torridge. <laughs> um, and of course, there are strong recreation benefits of woodland in the landscape, landscape benefits and so on. So there's a whole load of reasons why this target's been set. But there is also this key issue of trade-offs. They want to expand the forest by this amount, but not through unduly compromising something else that is also considered to be important. So for example, food production, or heather mould, which also has European designations for its protection and its expansion. So it's, it's a classic example of trade-offs, and I uh, think this is a really nice example that I'm going to show you next. So this is where spatial and temporal analysis is really important. So what I'm going to show you is work that was done a couple of years ago, um, led by my colleague Alessandro Gimona. Um, it's, in my view, one of the best examples of why you need to think ahead. So what this is on the left-hand side here is a model looking at um, the potential for joining up existing broadleaf woodlands and making a network to allow species to move, for example, move north if the climate gets warmer and they need to relocate. So he's um, been looking at how you can try and make a kind of overall estimation of permeability of the landscape effectively that allows a kind of um, the, the maximum number of woodland associated species to be able to move. So that's what this is showing you on, on the left here. All the little red dots that you can hardly see are the existing areas of broadleaf woodland. And um, the green and blue represent the, the degree of permeability, basically, so how good it is to make a network. So if I'm looking at it as an ecologist and saying, well, I want to know where the best um, potential areas are to allow species to move north, you would immediately say, well, OK, you can see one really obvious one here, um, which would allow them to move north. So it might be really important then to prioritise new woodland expansion in that area where you can see an obvious potential for them moving north. However, if we're thinking about trade-offs, let's consider just one trade-off here, so prime agricultural land. The map here shows you the current prime agricultural land. All the green areas are defined at the moment as prime agricultural land. So right now, if I take this little bit here, there's not much of a conflict if we increase woodland expansion there because you can see this isn't prime agricultural land, so great, let's go ahead, do it. But this is just the here and now. And woodland is, a, uh, is probably one of the slowest establishing habitat types that we have, so is, is this enough just to think about the here and now? No, of course it isn't enough, because we know climate has already changed, we know that's going to impact upon um, what we're defining as prime agricultural land, so let's have a look into the future and see whether this would still be the right decision. So there's the map that I just showed you before. 
And here is what the scientists are predicting as the change in um, area and location of prime agricultural land by 2050s under the most likely climate change scenario. So first you can see a huge expansion in what they um, expect will be prime agricultural land. The two different colours basically mean whether or not it's going to need in irrigation because there's also predicted changes in rainfall. So the point that I want to make then is if we go back to where there's a big gap here, actually some of that gap is now is likely to be filled, if you like, with prime agricultural land. So if we have prioritised woodland expansion um, through that critical network there, just a little thin line to allow species to move, and then by 2050 it actually becomes more important to put crops back there, if, if that forest that we've carefully established 30, 40 years previous gets chopped down again, then we've lost our route north-south. So a lot of land use decision making um, now absolutely critically has to think about things like this. And there's actually very little done as explicitly as this to say, hang on a minute, let's have a look at whether that's going to be the right decision in the future. And in fact, even this is oversimplistic because this is assuming that um, agriculture will still be as important as it, now, as it is now and we actually don't know if it will be as important, more important, or less important by 2050. So it's not just about the biophysical status here, which I've shown you, it's also about social norms and what we're actually wanting to do as, as human beings. So this is just one in a very complicated question, but it makes the point really clearly that we've got to think ahead. So um, what I'm doing here then is translating what I've just told you already. <laughs> um, this is the bottleneck here. Um, so all the brown areas on here now indicate where um, there's going to be the biggest conflict with predicted prime agricultural land in the 2050. So that makes the point that I just made on the previous slide. So what I want to do now then is, is move on to perceptions. There was a quite a nice introduction to that in terms of thinking about how we're going to prioritise agriculture in the future. So this is a whole area of research from our social science team. Um, because again, if, if you, you can make as many policies as you like, but if they aren't deemed to be something that people want to do, then many of them will fail. So it is really important to try to work out how can we incorporate people's perceptions and preferences and needs better and, um, and actually um, help alter land use decision making for the better. So this is a fairly obvious statement that we can't optimise to a specific best outcome for everybody. Everybody's got different perceptions, uh, needs, trade-off, you know, everyone thinks differently about this. So we can never get a single best outcome. So here's the critical elements for applying those tools and others that I just showed you examples of. First of all, defining what all the different criteria are that come into decision making. Like I showed you some, you know, a very small subset of examples as we went through those future scenarios. And allow people to actually change the weighting so they can see the implications of their perceptions. So if they think A, B and C are important, um, why should they be aware of the wider consequences of A, B and C? I wouldn't be aware of them unless I was able to use a model like that. So that's a really important thing that the models have to be able to do, is to help people visualise the wider consequences of any decision that they might make. And then you have to do this process of collective deliberation to actually allow people to come to some kind of consensus, because there will be trade-offs, there will be losses for all of us in terms of any decision. It, it'll never go exactly the way that everybody wants, because not everybody wants the same thing. So um, there is a growing toolkit of participatory methods. It's a whole industry out there. Um, and the, I the idea is just to try to make this process as successful as possible. The way it used to be done in the past was just to have a stakeholder meeting, tell them what you were going to do, listen to a few opinions, and then go and do it anyway. So it's much better now. And, and uh, you know, it's some, there's some really sophisticated techniques out there which I think are working really, really well. And one of the key components of successfully applying some of these land use mapping tools that I showed you is, is this key thing about discussion. So I've got an example that I will show you on the right hand side here. And for this, this ecosystem services approach where you are trying to consider sustainable use, conservation and equitable benefits, it's, it's, really, it's actually a very useful framework to help us all realise the wider implications of a decision we make. So, what I've got on the right here is a region of Scotland, Perth and Kinross, where our um, modelling scientists um, created those opportunity maps that you saw before. And this is an amalgam sh um, basically showing where would be better or worse for siting wind farms. So um, 
the colours are irrelevant here, but you just see that there's a spread. So it, um, in terms of all those different um, national data sets and local data sets all going into those models, that's what comes out. What they then did was actually take this map, two different stakeholder groups living in that region, and asked them to say, well, OK, there's lots of other reasons why you may or may not want a wind farm somewhere. So let's discuss all of those other things and come to a consensus about where we really don't ever want to have wind farms, even if they're really suitable areas, and where we, we would actually most like to have them. So this tiny little map down here is the end result when you've actually taken people's opinions and views and wishes into account. So now there's a very clear avoid these red areas at all costs. We don't want wind farms there for, for a whole host of reasons. And the blue areas are where they would absolutely most like them to be cited. So that is only done through a process of getting all the biophysical data together, but then translating it through what people want. So a nice example of something that I think we'll see more and more of now in terms of decision making. So what's also in development, I'm just going to flag this, and this is the next step that um, scientists are making. Again, it's not just in the James Hutton Institute, it's everywhere. It's basically allowing people to interact much more closely with maps. So basically what they can do is they can draw on, on a map like this on the web a little area around um, maybe somewhere where they live or somewhere where they know extremely well, and they can annotate them. So they can say, for example, you've actually got the land cover wrong here, it's not forest anymore, it got chopped down, or um, in this particular pocket of land is really important because we have our Halloween party there every year and we would never want that to change, or you know, all these different things, they can put that information in, and that can actually help the scientists who are making these models to improve these tools about land use um, choices. So how it's being used at the moment is in workshops, um, for what's called participatory mapping, but also there's great potential here to use it remotely so you can send things out to people. They can actually do it on their smartphones and, and feedback information on specific things that you may want to ask about. So watch out for this. I think there's going to be a lot more of it in the future. So this brings me to a summary, since I've dealt in great detail with a lot of tools. Let me summarise the tools for you. So I think you've probably got the message that the, the critical requirements are way more than just the data. So first and foremost, the message I want to give here is that we do need to understand and we do need to incorporate what and who is affected by and involved in any trade-off to do with land use. So just one little example here, since we've had a lot of forest in, through the theme, if we're thinking of that forest expansion versus farmland, if you put forest um, on farmland, you'll have less farmland, vice versa. You could just see it as a, as a simple trade-off between timber production and food production, for example, but it's much, much more than that. Those forests and those areas of farmland mean something different to the people who are living there. And like I gave you that kind of flippant example, if you like, of the Halloween parties, those are actually really, really important for all of us in this room, that the, the way we use the land is much more than just physically what's on it. So being able to bring those into your decision-making makes it a more complicated but much more helpful process. The second thing that's really critical then is recognising the role of not just space but also time, like I showed you in that example of looking into the future. And also acknowledging that social and political processes of decision-making are really important and the complexity involved in governing these systems is absolutely horrendous. So we, we are in a good situation now because we have the computer power to synthesise a lot of this complexity, but it's still horribly complex, even with that. So you know, I think we need to recognise that and just um, accept that it's not easy and it's not going to ever be easy to do. So here's my final slide. Um, and I want to just put this in context, really, of, of recognising limits. So we've got fantastic potential here. But as I've said all the way through, we're never going to have a world without trade-offs. Um, we can't always find synergies in decision making. There's always going to be something that's lost that people would rather isn't lost. And it doesn't matter how good our scientists' tools are and how good these deliberative participatory processes are, that's still always going to be something that we have to deal with. So the research that we do, like the examples I've shown you, shown you today, it can provide really important information to help decision making, particularly in something as complicated as land use. It can help address where things are more or less certain, which is also really useful for politicians to be aware of. They, they're very happy when we can tell them something that, that has a high degree of certainty and something that doesn't. And in fact, they're explicitly asking us for that now in many of the reports that we give. We have to have this uncertainty scale against every statement that we make. It also can highlight issues that may not otherwise have been picked up. So 
it is really useful what we do. However, the actual choices of trade-offs are not being made by us as scientists. We're just informing the process. So you'll see a whole load of, re of uh, different colours here. So these are the different levels at which these decisions are being made. So government, first and foremost, in terms of their policy design, are um, making trade-off choices straight away. And particularly if they're regulated pol regulatory policies, that's a very clear trade-off decision. In green, you've got government as well. You've got the NGOs and you've got the private sector who are giving funding and other support. So they're also hugely influencing trade-off choices just by that funding and or incentive scheme. And then in red, we've got all of us who are managing the land who are implementing all of these different policy instruments to actually make something happen on, on the ground because there's also flexibility at that level and one farmer and, and his neighbour may be doing something completely different even within that same set of policy incentives. So there are three very important and very different levels of impact on trade-off choices. And on top of all of that, there's strong, strong influence from those of us who don't manage land, but we're consumers and um, we're having a say at whatever level we have a say in what's going to happen to the land. And finally, of course, the research that we do is just part of this governance process. So our evidence, of course, has got to be robust, it's got to be visible, it's got to be effective, we've got to be very clear about where things are and are not certain. And this goes right across the science policy practice spectrum, and that's also very important as a scientist, I've got to be able to communicate this to the right people, otherwise, again, it's just going to sit in a dusty computer somewhere and not actually be used. But the success of all of this research that we're doing is completely dependent on policy and institutional change. Without that, it doesn't matter what research we do, it's not going to translate through into action. So that's my last slide. Um, I'd like to thank the Scottish Government in particular because they funded most of the work that I've talked about today. Um, I'm really curious to hear a bit more about the similarities and differences that you may be aware of within Wales. Any other comments or questions that you might have um, would be um, welcomely received and I'll see if I can do my best to answer them. Thank you.